explore and invent digital technology to help connect people to art. Philo is founding member of Unfold, a design studio that facilitates interaction that bridges digital and physical space. He is the initiator behind Papathon, an international series of Hack Jam events bringing together a multidisciplinary community of storytelling professionals who use the web as their medium. Philo. Thank you very much. And um, thank you very much for having me. Um, yeah, so Jan already gave that introduction, so very briefly. Um, Senegal, Slovak National Gallery, that's where I work. I work in uh, Lab Senegal, that's the, um, the digital R&D department. Um, yeah, like Jan already said, we try to invent technology to, um, to help to connect people to art uh, that is in the collection of the Slovak National Gallery or also in, uh, through some of our platforms, um, the art that is in other galleries. Um, so um, I work there as a, as a web developer, mostly. Um, when I uh, do my work at my studio, uh, called Unfold. Um, there uh, we do design, we design interactive experiences that bridge between digital and physical. So there I'm still programming, sometimes in Python, sometimes in other languages. Um, but it's much more than things that happen on a screen. At Unfold we're really talking about um, physical interactions, things you can hold in your hand or happen around you. Um, and then lastly, every two months I fly to London uh, where I teach at a great company called General Assembly uh, and I teach workshops there about uh, introduction to programming in Python and web scraping in Python. Um, what I want to do in this talk is um, very brief briefly talk a little bit about collecting and how that might work in a physical sense. Um, then I want to talk about the digitized collections that um, I work with, with my colleagues at the Slovak National Gallery. Um, and I want to explore in this talk really the last point, which is how can we breathe life um, into digital collections? And that's, that's really um, what I want to explore in this talk. So um, yeah, um, I'm not going to be actually talking a lot about Python, I'm sorry. Um, but um, what, I, what I hope that uh, this talk uh, can do is still be relevant to all of us or all of you guys and girls in the room um, because I think the, the tool of uh, programming in whatever language uh, you do that, um, it's a great tool to first of all be very precise and be very logic, but second of all um, make it easy to repeat things very easy so that you don't have to do that by hand. So. Um, any kind of language, whether that's uh, Python or another language, is very good at um, helping us with that and processing um, lots and lots of um, items like we have in, for example, an art collection. So I will be, because I work at Senegal, uh, talking a lot about the, from the perspective of digital art collections, but I hope that the points I'm going to make in the, uh, in the run of this talk um, that they are also, they can also apply to collections of another kind. Maybe you are um, uh, building with your company uh, or in your garage a new product hun hunt where you are building a tool to collect products or, or other things. Um, and I hope these things um, uh, are also relevant for you. So, uh, anyone know who this is? No? So his name is uh, Fido Dido. Um, you could have known him because he's, I think, late 80s PepsiCo bought him and he's been working for, for them as, as their mascot. Um, I'm not showing him because I want to make um, uh, advertisement for, for Pepsi or for 7up, um, but because he has a lot of nice quotes. And this is one of the quotes that uh, is printed on a t-shirt that I use as a pajama. Um, and he says, um, you are what you are and what you are is okay. Um, and that's kind of like um, one particular answer to this philosophical question of what determines your identity, right? And you could answer that question in many different ways. Some people like to say, well, you are what you eat. Or maybe some people say you are what you earn or you are who you know. Um, and actually, when I think to myself and I, and I look at how we define identity online in digital space, um, this is just a collection of things that, that um, 
uh, are defining either myself or, or people around me on some of the social networks that I'm uh, active on, a lot of those things are about how many followers do you have? How many tweets have you sent? How many uh, radio shows have you published? Um, how many languages do you speak? Um, so perhaps we might start to wonder, perhaps one way to define ourselves is also um, you are what you collect. Um, the, I guess the collection for me that started really my kind of like love for collecting things um, was Flippos. This was um, really big in the Netherlands where I'm from, uh, kind of during the mid 90s. Um, maybe people here know them as Pogs. It's kind of the same thing. You play games with them, uh, you can win them, but actually we weren't playing the games. We were just trading them and collecting them. Um, and they, um, uh, the way you collect them is this is actually pretty, pretty cheeky is that they would package these things with packets of crisps. So the way to collect these things is you beg and beg your parents to please buy more crisps. So it's actually quite an unhealthy kind of collection. Um, but yeah, so um, uh, after I collected the full first, um, first folder, the, the one in the middle there, um, of course they had to keep it going, they had to sell more crisps, so they, they released a, another folder, folder number two on the right. Um, and I also filled that one up. So it was really nice and satisfying because it came with the, these little pockets that were just exactly big enough to, to slot in your, your flippos. Uh, and they have, were all unique and they had a number, so it was also, you were really building up your collection and it was, it was, it was very satisfying. Um, so that's my kind of like, my opening to collecting things. Um, but maybe you might be f more familiar with, with these things, Tsechka. Um, although it's a little bit older than Flippos, um, or maybe these things, you know, like those stickers of football players. Um, did anyone collect this at some point, or maybe still? Yeah, okay, some hands go up. Okay, excellent. So these things are, are quite funny. I, I never used to collect these, actually. Um, however, um, a lot of my friends did, um, and, and, and they're published by this company called Panini. And it's called Panini because there are three Italian brothers that founded this, I think like really long time ago, like late 60s, maybe early 70s. Um, and this is a quote by one of the brothers. He says, the secret is in the game. It is the first game of chance for children. Okay, we're talking about betting here, you know. The feeling when opening the packet is the same as slowly opening a poker hand. So this insight that collecting cards from a packet that you buy at the corner shop and being surprised with a random set of, of cards, um, that that kind of like stimulates the brain in the same way that, that poker or other games of chance do. Um, that has worked very well for these brothers. Um, here on the background, uh, this is actually a photo I found um, on the website of the Umberto Panini um, uh, car museum, so he has this collection of, I think it's Maseratis or some, some other really expensive cars. So he, he doesn't only have a company that um, sells these kind of uh, collectible cars, but he also loved to collect these kind of uh, expensive cars. And of course he was able to do that because at some point the brothers sold Panini for, I think it was 98 million dollars or euros or something, a lot of money. Um, and if you're still wondering, okay, what am I talking about when I, when I say, can a collection and what you collect define you? Maybe we can just uh, look at a um, little uh, advertisement of Panini. Uh, beware, it is for the US, so it's a little bit American. Before I could dribble, I could dribble. Before I learned to throw, I learned to throw. Before I ever got air, I got air. Before I ran an offense, I ran the field. We're still talking about little cards I here. I felt the pain of a tackle and the thrill of net. Before I was a baller, I was a baller. Who do you root for? Who do you collect? I collect the FIFA World Cup sticker collection. <laughs> okay, beautiful. Who do you collect? 
All right. So I think that's um, a clear sign of, um, you know, at least the marketing team of Panini trying to enforce this idea that what you collect really uh, tells something about you. Um, so moving on. Um, yeah, so these three examples that I've given here are, are all examples of physical collections and physical things that you, uh, that you assemble and you, can, you, you collect. Um, and, and they have a certain uh, number of features in common, right? So first of all, they're space-bound. You know, I can only collect as many tzechkas as can fit into my house, you know? Um, and and when, some, when some of my stickers uh, are damaged or stolen, potentially, uh, by kids on the block, then, um, you know, I don't, I no longer have them. So they're, they're quite prone to, to being physically, physically damaged. Um, also, they have uh, what I call single view. So there's one particular way you arrange your flippos into your folder, and then that's it. You know, of course you can take it out, but like at one point, they, you can only sort them in one way. Generally, that's the way they are numbered. But it could be interesting to sort them all quickly by color. And that would be very hard with a physical collection. Um, lastly, they are not super accessible because if you have your collection in one place, that means that only the people in that place can see them, right? And the rest, maybe you can show them photographs. Um, so um, what I want to get to next is I want to talk a little bit about uh, the Slovak National Gallery. Um, and use it as a, as, a, as a use case or an example for, uh, to, to explore kind of some of the uh, advantages of digitizing what started as a physical collection of artworks um, and presenting them in a digital way. Um, so this building, for people who are from Bratislava, uh, you might recognize it. Um, it's uh, on the side of the, the Dunai. Um, unfortunately, though, this building is not in use for already now several years um, because it's, it's being reconstructed. It's unfortunately in a really terrible state. The ceiling was, was leaking. Um, but um, yeah, the Slovak National Gallery is um, reconstructing it already for uh, a couple of years and uh, several years to come. Um, so that means that all of a sudden, this institution has a lot less space to show their artworks. They're still um, you can actually just see it behind that bush over there, um, Esterazio Palace. Um, and there's still three floors there that are of obviously much smaller than this big, majestic uh, piece of architecture. Um, uh, so so, so, so can still show uh, smaller um, uh, exhibitions, um, but, but by far not uh, all of the amount of, of artworks that they have in their collection. Um, so luckily, um, this is the kind of the main work of, of my department. Um, uh, they decided to, to make an online platform, and uh, that online platform is called WebUmania. Um, and let's see if I can show you. Yeah. So this is WebUmania. And as you can see here, um, currently WebUmania hosts more than 100,000 artworks from uh, seven different uh, types, uh, seven different public galleries in Slovakia, and soon also one in Czech Republic that we are now partnering with. Um, and um, well, what is nice is we can explore all of those things. Um, we have um, a nice advanced search inter interface uh, that it, on the back end uses Elasticsearch. Um, and I can filter, well, let me uh, show only the public access ones, the ones that are out of copyright because they're older than 70 years, and also show me um, only the ones with a, with a picture. And um, you know, that's still almost 14,000 Im images there uh, left that are freely available to, for you to do whatever you want. Um, and I can l continue to load more and explore this. Um, or I can search actually for one of my favorite uh, artists. Let's say I'm really into Fula, um, and uh, Auto Suggest recommends him. And we see we now are exploring his his profile. Actually, it's kind of like a, a social network for 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 art. Um, uh, and we can link, of course, to all of his artworks. 
and um, end up at one. And uh, what we can also do is we can open it up full screen and actually zoom in super deep. So um, we can actually zoom in one to one resolution. Um, we're using a technology called Open Sea Dragon as a viewer uh, on the client side to, uh, to facilitate that. Um, so that is some of the things that um, are happening on uh, that you can do on, on Webomania. But Webomania was, was not always, we didn't always have the, all that digital material. Um, actually, let me full screen this again. Actually, the, um, the catalog uh, that Webomania is based on is somewhere in the basement of the administration building of the Slovak National Gallery and looks like this. So this paper catalog, we're back at, back at paper, was uh, created um, starting the early 1970s um, because the Ministry uh, of Culture decided, hey, we need to have an, an index, a catalog of all the public uh, art. And they, um, um, they put the Slovak National Gallery in charge of documenting all of that and building that, that index. So what they did, they sent art historians and pho uh, uh, photographers around the country to all the public galleries to index and document on these cards written out by on a typewriter um, all of the public art in Slovakia. And, and actually what is interesting is that Slovakia is one of the very few countries that has one single uh, central um, catalog of all the art. Canada has it, and for the rest, almost no European countries have this. Uh, so that's quite interesting. Um, and you can see, like, basically, this is this is one, you know, one type of model as you would have it in your database. With, um, you know, we see Inventar in Cislo, We have uh, the name of the artwork. We have the name of the author. All of your data is is pretty much there. So the first step in digitization that happened at Sunaga was starting from '91, where the curators got a lot of uh, art history students to literally type this data, uh, ignoring the image for, for that moment, just this, this metadata about the artwork, typing it into the computer so that it could finally be stored in, a, in an electronic database. Um, then, uh, from around um, 2012, uh, what started was a big um, digitization process of the actual paintings. So, um, um, basically scanning the paintings at this one-to-one -one resolution. And um, uh, the scanner you see here um, is costs, I think it's about 250,000 euros, and it scans at 650 megapixels. So this is, this is really huge. Um, I see that I need to speed up uh, just a little bit. Um, so basically that, that, that is the way, the, the journey of how we got all of this stuff onto Webomania. Um, so to basically, to summarize that, that, that idea of, of Webomania, all of the, the, the advantages of a platform like that um, is that it makes the art accessible beyond the gallery, um, internationally, all over the world, 24-7. Um, it lets you, as a visitor, personalize your experience because you can search for, for what you want. Um, all the artworks have their own URL so you can share it. Um, and for, for the Slovak National Gallery, it's interesting because it provides them also with data about what are people interested in, in uh, exploring. Um, another feature we have is that you can order reproductions because now that they're digital, we can Before I can them. dribble. Um, and I could we dribble. make available these open source uh, content, the open access content. Um, we are putting everything on GitHub. So at the end of this slide, um, I will include a, a, a link to that if you want to check it out. And we also have an API. So if you want to build something on top of Webomania, uh, you can totally use that. Um, and um, that's all great, but um, how can we make sure that it's not just a digital version of this archive in the basement? You know, How can we make sure that people actually use this and you know, have an experience of it? And um, I'm, I'm quite inspired by these quotes that I quite quickly want to read you out. Um, first of all, uh, John Falk says, you know what, it, it's not about creating different ex exhibits and programs, it's about creating different visitor experiences. Um, uh, Gavin Mallory says, um, museums are experience factories. 
Um, and what they do is they have the power to make us respond, to engage, to experience, and to feel. So how can we start to breathe life into these uh, digital collections? And I want to show you um, a couple of projects. Um, for the reasons of time, I'm going to skip over some. Um, but uh, these slides um, are online, so you can uh, explore them uh, by yourself. Uh, the first project that I actually did when I started working um, uh, at Senegal was uh, creating an interactive video, which is using a short documentary film um, that actually talks about many of the artworks. And what I did was actually brought in alongside of the video just little iframes of the pages of these artworks and these authors. So the video tells you a story, and we can actually bring in along that story the, uh, the artworks that are being talked about. Um, and this is something I want to actually zoom in on. This is uh, one of our most recent projects um, that is part of a, um, well, there was an accompanying uh, an exhibition called Sens Kutocznost um, about the art and the propaganda of the Slovak state. Um, so quite a heavy topic. Um, but what the curators weren't able to do uh, is to explain the entire historical context of what was happening politically during that time. Um, so there was no space for that in the exhibition, so we decided to put, make that available on the website. So what we did is we worked together with uh, a scriptwriter, but also with a graphic designer, um, and we made this, uh, this microsite. And um, um, basically, to keep it short, we have here four chapters that you can explore um, in your own way. And we've really tried really hard to make this a very pleasant um, experience. It works very well on mobile as well. I'm really happy about that. And again, this is a story that cuts through not only history, but also pulls in the art that we already have published on Webomania. So same kind of nice zooming functionality is uh, what you get here embedded on the website. Realistically, how much time have I got? OK, OK, so I'll try to do that. Um, what you can also do with um, when you have a collection like that is, of course, uh, learn from it. Um, and why not use machines for that? So um, this is a project, again, please check it out uh, following the link at the end of the slides by the um, Norwegian National Museum with a design studio called Bengler. And they, apply, they explored how can they uh, apply machine learning to all of this content, all this visual content um, that the National Museum of Norway has uh, in their collection. Um, and, and lastly, one thing that, that we do, uh, we did last year, we hope to do it this year again, is organize a hackathon to actually um, invite external technologists, but also artists and designers to work together on, um, on different things powered by the content that we have on Webomania. Uh, and also the uh, Norwegian National Museum participated in that. Um, so to summarize, first of all, collect, collect something. Collect whatever you're interested in. Um, if necessary, if those things that you're collecting are, are not digital yet, digitize. Um, show them off online. Um, the, the very minimal that, that, that visitors um, expect these days is something that re responds nicely, uh, scales down nicely on mobile, um, and has a good user experience. So that's really the minimal. Um, um, but what I, wh the, the point I want to make is that from there, we can build something gr even greater on top. So try to connect these pieces, create experiences, weave webs, and tell stories that build on all of that content. Um, and that way, you can really provide your visitors or whoever is your audience um, with an actual experience of your content. Um, so thank you very much. Sorry that I went a little bit over time. Happy collecting. And this is a link to, to the slides if you want to check out any of the references. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Philo. And there's a bunch of questions that we have. Cool. So let's get, get right there. Um, 
there is the GitHub link with a comment. Wow, Slovak National Gallery is on GitHub. Uh, any other galleries or public institutions in Slovakia or neighboring countries? Um, that's a good question. If for Slovakia and neighboring countries, I'm not sure. Um, one thing right now is that uh, I know that I, I mentioned that partnership um, with an, another public gallery um, uh, in Czech Republic, that's the uh, Moravska Gallery. Um, uh, so they will be joining us, so that means that, that their stuff will, will run in the same open source way. Um, I don't actually know other uh, gallery institutions in Slovakia, um, but what I can say is that there's actually um, quite a, a community of people who are working in museums, whether that's on the uh, online collections or on uh, technology to help in the physical exhibitions um, that are publishing their stuff openly. Um, maybe I can um, add a little overview of that um, uh, to, the, to the references, but, but if you Google, um, you'll find a lot. There's also a um, Muse web, a Museums on the Web conference, and a lot of people are presenting interesting papers there uh, alongside uh, links to GitHub. So that's another thing you can check out. And the follow-up question to that, uh, when you publish source code on GitHub, is it just source code that uh, you as employees or contractors of the Slovak National, National Gallery developed? Or is there also some software you know, contributed by third parties, like if, if there are any companies developing for the Slovak National Gallery, is it just the employees or is it also the, uh, the companies building software for, for the gallery? So the main piece of software that is externally developed um, for the Slovak National Gallery is um, actually the collection management system. Um, I would have to check whether that actually that particular instance as it is customized for us is actually on GitHub. Uh, I'm not sure, but I know that it runs on um, um, Fedora, not the operating system, but a, a Fedora uh, content Watches. management system. Yes. Um, to tie everything together. So I know that that's already building on open source itself. I'm not sure if they um, themselves, that external company, publishes that. Not on our GitHub. So on our GitHub is really just the things that we, as at the department, um, publish. And, and, and for us, it's, it's the default. It's like there's nothing we are hiding. It's just it's all on there. It would be a wonderful showcase, you know, if, if also software developed for the gallery was was published that way. Totally, and I think, I think um, we have uh, uh, an obligation to do that as a, as a public institution because we are funded by public money. So um, yeah, that should go back into the open, I think. Mm -hmm. Which kind of license applies to the content of webumenia.sk? Um, that's a good question. Um, I think when we are talking about um, things that are public domain, um, so they are kind of like, ex like the the, um, the intellectual property, the copyright has expired. I think that's actually a, a Creative Commons, um, maybe even zero. But um, let let me just check that. Um, I think it's zero. It it can be. So, I mean, if we if we look here, yeah, this is um, this is completely public domain. So you can really do. Uh, you can really do. Um, whatever you want with that, even something commercially. Um, that, that those are the things that are out of copyright. The other things, um, we would like to, to, to open source everything, but um, uh, we are also tied by things that, that are just still in copyright. Yeah. Can you tell us more about a lab SNG? It seems interesting that a Slovak gallery has a digital R&D team. Absolutely. It's great. <laughs> um, I don't know. What do you want to know about it? Um, we, we are small. Uh, so um, we are two programmers. I'm half time, and then my great colleague uh, Igor Ryabinin, who some of you might know, um, he's actually the guy who uh, built Webomania uh, by himself. So uh, really heads off to that. Um, so we're the two programmers. Then we have uh, two people on content and um, uh, one uh, great leader of of, of the gang, uh, Micha Trudenak, who. Uh, um, who pulls everything together. Um, so, so that's the size. And um, yeah, like um, both Igor and I, like our, our skills are mostly in web development. So the type of uh, projects that, that we do, even when we sometimes make a mobile app, like um, a couple of months ago, I made a, a mobile app for an audio tour. Um, 
generally the way we approach that is we, we make a web app and then we package that with uh, something like PhoneGap, for example. Uh, so usually the, the, the things that, that, that I'm working on are uh, written in web technology. Have you ever considered to present historical documents like historical letters, contracts, in a similar way? Um, me personally, not really, because I, I don't own a collection like that. But um, uh, I think there's many people who are uh, thinking about those kind of things and are already doing it. So um, kind of like the, um, the community of people thinking about um, how to apply digital technology to help people or to help museums in their mission to reach people. Um, that community is, is kind of uh, closely related to librarians and actually like a lot of uh, some, some of the people uh, in my department have their background in library science. Um, so yeah, I, I think there's like many examples of libraries that um, have a collection like that with old documents. I think the, the British Library, for example, um, publishes uh, a large collection online uh, and I assume that they have a lot of old documents in that as well. What do you do, and this is one about digitization, what do you do when you cannot fit a painting in your scanner? That's a very good question. So like, first of all, that, um, that scanner that I showed you, that, that's, that's pretty big, right? So like a lot of, yeah, uh, most, most paintings, it's, it's actually like, first of all, it's, it's custom made. Like the, the company that makes these, they, they only make custom scanners. Um, so, I'm just assuming here because I'm, this is not really my, my expertise, but I'm, I'm assuming that um, in that customization um, was taken into account, okay, how do we cover most of the sizes that are in the collection of, um, of, of Senegal that needs to be scanned? Um, um, to be honest, I'm, I'm not really sure, but I'm sure that there is um, um, ways how you can scan one part of a painting first and then a second and then stitch it together. Um, what, uh, maybe something that relates to that is like, what do you do with things that are not flat? Because how do you scan those? Um, that's something that we haven't really started uh, at a massive scale, um, but it's something that, that I have been exploring in, in my studio work. It's like, okay, how can you actually use uh, simple techniques like photography to create a 3D model? Um, like, if it was up to me, we would have for all the sculptures and all the 3D objects in the collection, we would have a nice interactive, rotatable uh, 3D model on the website. But um, yeah, there's still a lot of work to do to, to just continue to scan all the, all the flat things. So they will take a little bit longer. If you're really curious and would like to follow up, uh, you, can, you can tweet at Philo maybe, or, um, and also or there's at other- Webumania. Or Web Or Webumania, that's right. And there are also other uh, digitization projects going on in other places within uh, within the culture culture sphere. So um, if you are interested about about those, uh, do reach out to us and we'll we'll find uh, who who to connect connect you to. Um, there's a huge digitization projects in books and um, you know other museums are uh, museums are also involved. So also film like I, I know for example like the I'm not sure if it's the name but the the Slovak uh, National Slovak Film Institute um, is involved in a huge digitization. Uh, of, of old Slovak films. Yeah. This is beautiful, but I feel many people do not actually know it exists. What can be done to help to spread this to, the, to a broader community? So, so what is it? Um, is it Webumania or is uh, it the GitHub? What, what, what is it? Um, because that, that's like these things, um, this question, like, how can we do this? This is also like, how can we make sure that people know about it, right? So, um, for example, um, um, you know, uh, something like a website uh, like Sensku Točnost is, um, it, it's, it's accompanying an exhibition, but actually what, what we see is that um, there's a lot more people who see this than just the visitors to the gallery. 
Um, and that's also really what, what we aim to do with this website and why we've invested quite a lot of time and resources into, into creating it into a really accessible and, and, um, and, and, and good experience is that we hope this to be online for the next five years at least. You know, we, we want this to be a resource so that people can come here and, uh, and learn from it or, or use it as a tool to have a discussion. Um, and what I find really beautiful is that, you know, I'm now in Slovakia for about a year and a half. Uh, I've already learned a lot about the history from this country through the work that I'm doing. Um, and I think that something, a project like this also has the, the, um, uh, the potential to inform people about history, um, uh, facilitate discussions, debates, and make people more informed. So um, I'm really excited that, that we can do that, not only at a museum, but also reach, reach wider. Yeah. And the final question, can you tell us a, a bit more about how you became involved with the Slovak National Gallery? Um, yeah, sure. So um, first of all, um, with Unfold, with my studio, we were um, doing a lot of work with um, something that I just alluded to already, where um, we were making 3D models uh, using um, photographs. That's a technique called photogrammetry. Um, and um, uh, some people at the Slovak National Gallery, they heard about that and they were really interested in using that technique to um, do a workshop for people um, and get them to create something creatively and then digitize that. So again, this was part of um, a, a wider philosophy that, that happens at Sundergrove, like, okay, what, how can we explore further this uh, process of digitization? Um, it also coincided with an exhibition um, at the beginning of last year um, showcasing what, what kind of um, value can digital technology bring in the space of an, of an exhibition. Um, and we, we ran this workshop uh, about photogrammetry where we worked with people to make something out of, out of clay and, and then digitize it into a 3D model. And that was the first time that I uh, heard about them. And that they told me, oh yeah, you know, like we put everything on GitHub and I was like, guys, you really understand this shit. That's great. Um, and so then uh, I had contact and then a couple of months later, not really looking for a job, um, my girlfriend found on Facebook that they were uh, looking for, for another developer and I thought, why, why not give it a shot? And uh, yeah, now here I am for almost a year working with them. Thank you so much, Philo. Thank you.